Hi, this is Dr. Gold. Uh, in this video, we're going to review some of the content from Chapter 1. Each week uh, on Blackboard, you're responsible for completing each uh, module and set of assignments included within it. And Step 1 of each module is typically a PowerPoint uh, slide for that chapter, uh, maybe a video like this, um, or a video done by somebody else about the content for that chapter. Um, I'm starting out using uh, the PowerPoint slides that come with the textbook because I want you to be familiar with what they look like. Um, but I do have other PowerPoint uh, presentations that uh, cover content within the textbook that are not uh, publisher-generated uh, PowerPoint files, and you'll see those later on in the semester. So let's get started here and just kind of review some of the highlights from Chapter 1. Before I get into the actual slides, I will tell you that the uh, video you're watching lasts for about 14 minutes or so, um, and that you know m many of the things contained within this video, um, you know, are not addressed specifically within the textbook. Uh, there are five basic steps to personal financial planning. Uh, they're listed here. Uh, evaluate your financial health, you know, define your goals, develop a plan, and so forth. Um, evaluating your financial health is really uh, step one because you can't build a plan until you know where you're at financially. Uh, the plan part of it is the personal financial plan that you'll be doing during the course of the semester. Uh, and you know, evaluating your financial health will be done over the first two weeks of the semester. So you'll be tracking some of your spending, where you spend money, where your money comes from, and so forth, and uh, then begin to build a plan moving forward. As you define a lot of your goals, whether it be um, to get a certain job or uh, achieve a certain level of education or save a certain amount of money for the future or pay off uh, debts that you have, um, you need to implement that plan. So you have to have a plan of action and then begin to implement your plan moving forward. I think the most important step in uh, personal financial planning, at least in my life experience, is step five, which is to review the uh, plan that you've developed, uh, reassess it, uh, change it and modify it as your life circumstances evolve. You know, life is a funny thing, you know, and it tends to throw you a lot of curveballs from time to time, you know, and because stuff just happens um, suddenly, and sometimes we're not, you know, prepared for it, uh, it requires us to revisit um, our plan, uh, make modifications to it, and readjust. Establishing your goals can be done over short, intermediate, or long-term uh, goal structures. Um, you know, and I'll give you some examples of those over the next couple of slides. You know, short-term goals are typically, you know, less than a year, uh, intermediate goals might be up to 10 years, and long-term goals like you know saving for retirement, for example, might be a, a long-term goal. Uh, short-term goals could be, um, you know, an example. A good example here is uh, developing a savings account for, let's say, three months of your living expenses. And the reason that that's important is because uh, if God forbid you lose your job. Uh, you know, what do you do? It's a very, very stressful situation. You know, nobody wants to lose their job or even plan for losing their job, but it obviously does happen. So if you have, uh, at least in the back of your mind, the knowledge that you have three months of money to cover your living expenses, whatever those expenses might be, it doesn't make losing the job better, but it makes it less painful. Um, we have a tendency when we lose jobs to panic, and that's a normal uh, reaction and behavior pattern. So um, one of the things that a plan will do will be to alert you and remind you that if that happens, uh, the first thing you should do is to eliminate a lot of your expenses, living expenses. Uh, for example, cable TV or you know driving less and using public transportation and not eating out and so on. Taking those steps very early on, if you were to lose a job, um, will extend the amount of time that that three months or six months of savings that you've accumulated will last. If you don't make those changes right away and you just continue to live your life the way you've always lived your life, and now that you no longer have that job, 
obviously the money won't last very long and if you don't find a job within that three month period of time it can become a very very stressful situation so that's an example of a short-term goal and how it might apply to your life intermediate goals might be saving for a down payment on a house uh, or paying off uh, you know major debts that you have accumulated uh, long-term goals could be uh, saving for a retirement uh, in the future uh, or uh, considering purchasing a second home for retirement later on uh, or saving for a grandchild's education um, if that's something that you desire to do as well. Uh, other people uh, have long-term goals of uh, taking care of older uh, family members or starting a business um, later on in life. Um, in fact, a lot of the data related to entrepreneurship indicates that uh, the highest rate of uh, new business ventures are being created by people 55 years of age or older um, who are pursuing uh, sort of like encore careers in their own lives. There are uh, three life stages. The first is, you know, up to age 54. So I'm kind of getting toward the end of stage one in my life. Um, you may be uh, past stage one and in stage two, or you may be at the beginning part of stage one. I don't really know because I can't see you, obviously. Uh, but uh, wherever you are, it's never too late to sort of assess your situation and stage in life. Um, during stage one, um, you want to develop patterns of behavior, um, you know, saving every month, for example, um, paying off credit card debts that you might have, and so forth. Uh, those are in, important behavioral patterns to establish early on, so they become rather routine over the course of your life, and that can lead to financial stability. Uh, stage two is, you know, sort of in between, you know, your early uh, life and approaching, um, you know, retirement. And uh, this would be sort of modifying the investments you might have or make um, to be a bit more conservative and less risky because you can't afford to take as much risk as you approach retirement and to sort of reassess where you're at financially at that point in your life. Uh, stage three is obviously retirement. So a lot of people li would like to think of retiring and some people do retire, but obviously many, many people don't retire. There has been a major um, problem that has evolved in our society over the past 20 years or so. It used to be that you know my parents or grandparents would get out of school, uh, get a job with a company, and kind of ride this career escalator, so to speak, where they would get job increase, uh, pay increases, and accumulate retirement benefits. And then they'd get to the age of 65, and they would kind of step off the escalator and open up a free spot at the bottom of the escalator for a young person just starting out in life to get on. Well, over the past 20 years, the problem that's evolved is that people are not getting off the escalator. Uh, people are staying on uh, well beyond the age of 65 for many reasons. One, they didn't plan uh, properly for their retirement and don't have the money to retire. Uh, two, people are living longer um, and uh, therefore working longer. Uh, three, some people love their work and don't want to stop working. Whatever the reasons are, it's creating congestion all the way down this metaphorical escalator all the way to the bottom, and it's becoming increasingly difficult for young people to gain entry onto that escalator. This is why uh, entrepreneurship has become very popular for a lot of young people because it's a way for young people to develop uh, and build their own escalators in terms of a career. You know, starting your own business can be scary and certainly is, is risky. Um, you know, I've had successful businesses and failed businesses. Um, I currently still have a business in New York and a couple here in Tampa. Um, and, but it's it's something that gives you a lot of freedom and autonomy as well and allows you to prepare for your future um, sort of independently and not having dependency on others, companies or otherwise. Uh, thinking about your careers, I think the most important thing here, which is covered in the textbook, is to choose a career that animates you and excites you. Um, does it give you personal satisfaction um, whatever career it is you're thinking about. Because if you pursue something just for the money, um, what, what's going to always end up happening is there's always going to be somebody who's doing the job that you have 
who's not doing it for the money. They're doing it because they love it or they're passionate about it. And those are the people that will always shine above everybody else. Um, whereas if you're doing something because you really care deeply about it, this is how you can shine and be recognized by others and be able to rise up uh, the ladder, so to speak, quicker. Um, getting a job can be challenging. Um, dressing appropriately, uh, preparing for interviews is a really important process. Um, you know, tucking your shirt in, wearing clean clothes, you know, uh, you know, dressing appropriately for different types of interviews is important. Researching companies that you're going to interview for, um, having your resume updated and uh, a reflection of that specific job always helps as well. Uh, these are some uh, interview questions I'm not going to go over, but they're in the textbook and you should certainly look at them. There are a couple of key determinants that go into um, you know, a level of income that a person makes. And certainly education is one of those. You know, so like I, I happen to have a PhD. Uh, I got it later on in life. Um, but there is no doubt that the more education you have, the higher the, earn, the lifetime earnings are that you encumber. So um, education is a great thing. It's an expensive process uh, to go through. But there is no doubt that the reward of increasing the level of education that you have uh, is worthwhile in terms of the compensation that you can earn over the uh, lifetime uh, that you're working. There are some principles of personal finance that I'm just going to kind of go through and are covered in detail in the textbook. Uh, they're sort of like the foundations of this entire course. Uh, and principle one is the best protection is knowledge. So this is sort of like why you're taking this class, you know, is to become more knowledgeable about personal finance um, and to make uh, more sound decisions moving forward. Uh, principle two is nothing happens without a plan, and that's true. It's like, what's the difference between an entrepreneur, entrepreneur and a non-entrepreneur? Well, an entrepreneur is somebody who takes action on their ideas, um, whereas somebody who just has ideas isn't an entrepreneur. It's the same thing here. You know, nothing's going to happen if you don't have a plan. You know, you have to have a plan in order to be able to execute on it. Principle three, which is critical, is the time value of money, which we'll cover in great detail in later chapters. Suffice to say that a dollar today is worth more than a dollar tomorrow is the core of that concept because you can invest a dollar today and have more tomorrow than if you waited a day to get the dollar in uh, one day from now. Um, and here's an example of that. You know, if you took uh, at the age of 20, uh, $33, uh, $33 a month and earn 12% per year on that, you would accumulate a million dollars by the age of 67 years of age. So there's different graphs like this, and we'll cover more of this stuff when we get to those chapters. Uh, chap principle four, taxes affect your personal financial decisions. Well, that's true. Um, you have to know what type of investments you're making, and you have to always be alert to um, what the uh, processes that's involved in filing taxes and what your tax obligations are. Uh, principle five we've already talked about, which is that stuff just happens from time to time, so you have to kind of be prepared for those things when they occur. Principle six is waste not, want not. This basically means live within your means. Um, you know, understand that you know, stuff that you want isn't necessarily a need. Uh, a need is something you have to have. A want is something you'd like to have. Uh, so sort of balancing your life between those two worlds is critical in being able to execute a sound financial plan. Uh, principle seven is protect yourself against major catastrophes. So obviously insurance is a really important thing to protect your assets. Uh, and we'll talk about life insurance when we get to that chapter. Uh, in principle eight, risk and return go hand in hand. There's a graph here that kind of illustrates that. Uh, the lower the return, the, uh, the lower uh, the risk that you're taking. If you want to get a higher rate of return, you have to be willing to take on more risk. And we'll cover all of that as we get to the investing chapters as well. So that's chapter one, a brief overview. Uh, and we'll pick up the ball next week with chapter two.